Andrzej. Um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, a special guest for this time. Thank you. I have just received such incredible, wonderful <coughs> hospitality since I've been in this country, and uh, it's just great to see all of you here. Ben, just... <laughs> so I'm really excited. I, the only thing I want to say is I know some people are wondering what kind of crazy person would go and make this movie. So I just want to tell you just a very, very briefly about myself, and then we'll watch the movie. I'm a lifelong environmentalist. The first time I ever picked up a camera was when I was uh, about 11 years old. I made a movie about the first Earth Day, um, a little film of, of pollution in my little town. First time I ever made a real documentary was about nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific. A film called Radio Bikini, got nominated for an Oscar, launched my career. So I, I come out of anti-nuclear, environmental, uh, not activism, I've never been an activist, but that's how I came to this. And my last film before this was a history of the environmental movement. So I say this uh, to you that I've, the conclusions I've come to um, have been considered for many, many years, a lot of research, a lot of thinking, and whether you agree with me or disagree with me, uh, that's the spirit in which these conclusions are offered to you, and I hope that's the spirit in which they're taken. I think we're gonna have a great Q&A, great discussion afterwards, and enjoy the film. I'm gonna go, I've seen it before, so I'm gonna talk to it, um, and enjoy it. Okay, thanks. Yes, right here. So how are you rolling it out? How am I rolling the film out? Um, well, the film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January. We released it uh, in theaters in the United States in June and July. Got a tremendous amount of press attention. I think we've had nine articles in the New York Times about this movie, which is extraordinary. Uh, we really have had a really remarkable impact in the United States already when uh, the subject of clean energy, climate change, you know, what do we do about this? When that comes up, this film is referenced, and the subject is referenced. Nuclear power is now something that's talked about. It's been extraordinary to me for so many years. One of the things that, you know, one of the motivations I had for making the film is just time after time I'd read articles in the paper that talk about what do we do about climate change, always referring to clean energy, and, and nuclear would never be mentioned ever be mentioned, even though it's about 50% of the world's clean electricity is nuclear. The other 50%, just about, is hydro and wind and solar are just really, really tiny, tiny amounts right now, as you saw in the graph on this. So it's just amazing to me that the N-word is never spoken. And what I've found in taking this film around is by saying nuclear, by making it okay for us to talk about this, it's like a breath of fresh air into a very stale conversation that's been going nowhere for many, many years. And people do get quite excited about it. So we've had a big impact there. I'm now taking out around the world. We're here in Australia. Uh, next week I go to Japan. We're releasing in cinemas in Japan. A couple weeks after that, we're opening in the United Kingdom. And I'm just gonna keep going as long as they can go. Uh, there's interest all over the world. Um, and this, particularly universities, colleges, stuff like that. So it is having an impact. Oh, it's going to be on CNN. It's going to be broadcast on CNN in the United States on November 7th. It's going to be, we're the first film ever to be released in 25 countries on iTunes simultaneously. It's going to be on December 3rd. So it's going out globally that way. Anybody else? You had Richard Branson on the credits for the film? Yes. Um, interesting that you had these, been part of this, yet uh, on LinkedIn, which I use a lot. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the finding renewable that Right. Uh, well, Richard Branson is a uh, Richard Branson um, saw the film after it was completed and, and very generously lent his name and his brand to being an executive producer on, on this film. He is hugely supportive of renewable energy, as am I. I, 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 I support new, uh, renewable energy. I just don't think renewable energy is enough. Uh, well, not only do I not think new, new, uh, renewable energy is enough, it's just arithmetic. It's arithmetic that brought me to this, not uh, any love for nuclear power. As, uh, you know, to me, 
To me, nuclear power is a tool to an end. It's a means to an end. I think one of the one of the uh, ways that the environmental movement has sort of gone astray on this issue is they started to perceive renewables, wind and solar in particular, as the end. Like that's the goal. Well, that's not the goal. The goal the goal is to power a growing planet um, that's using gargantuan amounts of energy with non-CO2 emitting, non-polluting energy, whatever that may be. And we, it's incumbent upon us to look at all of those sources of energy, not just wind and solar. So if we could power the whole world with algae, that would be okay with me too. I've got no skin in the game for nuclear. I'm not, I don't have investments in it. I don't care about nuclear. Nuclear is just a means to an end to me, as is wind and solar. But if you do the math, you got a real problem because, I mean, this is, you know, one of the one of the key assumptions that so many of us in the environmental movement had that we were mistaken about um, was what's going on in the developing world. And if you look at all of the studies that say, oh, we can power the world with renewables, all of them assume that we're going to actually reduce energy demand quite dramatically through uh, energy efficiency. Um, we are now, today, every year we are adding the equivalent of another Brazil to the planet. Every year. That's how fast the world is growing. Obviously that's not going to go on forever, but that's what's happening right now. How many people think that we could power Brazil with renewables in one year? Would that be done? I don't think so. We got to do that. and 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 and. Say we, we played that out, we'd have to, we have to replace the entire fossil fuel infrastructure of the entire planet with wind and solar. We'd have to replace all of nuclear power, which is 13% of global electricity right now, with nuclear power, because we're against nuclear power, right? And we'd have to add another Brazil worth of energy every year. The math just doesn't add up. And it's that math that has caused a growing number of us who are really concerned about energy, really concerned about climate, really concerned about human development, because you know it's a it's a moral imperative to lift billions of people out of poverty. I believe to look at nuclear power as a potential solution to this um, dilemma. And remember, you know, there's two billion people who don't have any electricity at all, none. Um, so you got all the people that don't have enough electricity, you got all the people that don't have any electricity. They all want to live like us. And they're going to. The other assumption, the other assumption that we we in the environmental movement um, underestimated, we all thought that we were going to run out of fossil fuels, and that that would. You're shaking your head. That we all, <laughs> we all thought we were going to run out of fossil fuels, and that that would force a transition. And in fact, the technological revolution that we've all experienced with our iPhones and computers and everything else has allowed us to extract ever more resources, uh, fossil fuel resources out of the ground. So that globe that's lighting up, it's not that I want that globe to light up like that, or that's you know a great thing and everybody's gonna be living happily ever after. There's a lot of questions you know, to be raised about whether our materialist capitalist society is making us happy, but the fact is, it's happening. It's happening and it's gonna happen because there's so much fossil fuels. It can happen. And if we do it with fossil fuels, we're toast. So it's incumbent upon us to find another source of energy. If you got more questions, I'll stop talking. And you have a question. Yeah, um, it might be unfair to ask you as a visitor to our wonderful state to, to comment. But earlier this year, we've actually had days where half the state's electricity has been derived from wind and solar, uh, the uptake of solar panels huh? on people's roofs and, and large wind farms. So we're doing really quite well with wind and solar. We also have the world's largest uranium deposit. In fact, it's so big, it's bigger than the next 20 in the world combined, sitting in our backyard. What would you say we should do with respect to take up the solar here in South Australia? Well, I don't have a lot of hair on my head, as you might have noticed. And I've been really sunburned since I've been here. You guys have a lot of sun. And you got a lot of desert, and you got a lot of wind, if, if Australia can't do, uh, go completely renewable, I don't know what country could. I mean, I think, I mean, I would love to see you guys do it. I mean, 
pro you are more blessed with wind and sun and open space to, to do renewables in any country in the world. So I, you know, if you wanted to lead the world in that direction, I think that'd be a great and wonderful thing. There are gonna be places where wind and solar are gonna do really great, and I think Australia is one of them. Um, you know, the North Sea, for instance, is doing fabulous with, with offshore wind because it's really shallow and, and there's a lot of steady wind and that's, pretty, that's, that's been great. There are places that it just doesn't really work and they're gonna need nuclear power or, or other things. I mean, there is a problem of intermittency, there's a problem of scalability, there's a problem of inter integrating it to a, into a grid. When you get renewables, which are an intermittent source of energy above a certain percentage, you know, 20, 30%, nobody's ever gone that higher than that consistently. Um, it starts to become problematic. Maybe those things can be solved, but I, I, I'm, I'm not against wind and solar. We're gonna need, in order to solve this problem, we're gonna need absolutely everything. What the, I have a problem is, is with, with, with people who say that the climate change is an existential threat to human civilization, which I believe it is. Um, I don't believe it is. I, I, I trust the climate scientists who suggest that this is the case. Believe them, I don't have any empirical evidence of it because I don't study this stuff, but that's, that's what they say. Okay. Um, it's an existential threat to human civilization, but it's not such an existential threat that I need to engage in every source of non-CO2 emitting energy that's out there, that I will take nuclear off the table and take that risk, take that risk that maybe we won't power the entire world with wind and solar. So Australia could do it, but you know, there are periods in Northern Europe, for instance, in the, in the winter months where, and I'm sure some of you spend time there, I, I grew up in England partly, where you know, 10 tenths cloud cover for months at a time and no wind. You get these, these times where there's zero renewable energy being created in Europe and then you get other times where there's a lot. So what happens in that time when you get zero? It's fossil fuels. So that's the problem. If we want to get rid of fossil fuels, we've got to think of another thing that's gonna be that base load, steady 24 seven source of energy. And nuclear right now seems to be the best available thing that we have that can do that. You know, maybe fusion will come, you know, maybe 30, 40 years, we'll figure that one out and we'll do that, I don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, do you, you use France as an example in the film um, in making the decision to go away from fossil fuels for electricity generation? Do you know what investment the country made and what period of time uh, took before they were productive? Uh, I don't have figures on the investment. I do. I can tell you this: the, the great, the great example of, of France is that they did it in about 20 years. And I know this is an argument that I often hear: is well, you just can't scale up nuclear quick enough to solve this problem. I mean, as if you can scale up renewables quick enough. I mean, it is a problem. You know, I mean, you could say maybe we just can't. You could say, throw your hands up in the air and say, well, we can't, we can't scale up anything quick enough because the problem is so gargantuan. But nuclear does, does the, our experience with nuclear suggests that you can scale it up quick enough. Uh, Sweden did it, France did it, uh, virtually decarbonized the electric grid in about 20 years using 1970s era technology. So um, um, it does suggest that it can be done. And right now, um, um, uh, France has the lowest electric rates in Europe, uh, this is not subsidized by the government, it's a private private industry. It was government money initially that was put in, it was a subsidized thing, it's been private enterprise for a long time. Um, they've got the cleanest air in the industrialized world, um, and it is working. So it can be done if you're looking at a you know, practical example of, of uh, time scale. With it, you know, and, and climate scientists tell us we have about 20 years to solve this, so. Yes, ma'am. You don't look old. Oh, you mean that they're not in the film? Yes. Well, it was really hard to find anybody who comes from an environmental background to come forward on this subject because you run a great risk. I run a great risk by making this film. Everybody in the, who in this film is run a great risk in just their social connections, their family relations, their career relations, because none of us are working for the nuclear industry. We're not getting paid for doing this. It's a risky thing to do. But very few people have come forward. 
but in terms of a generational, there is a huge generational split on this issue that I've noticed taking the film out around the world, and that young people really get this. Uh, many of them have a feedback. incredible feedback, and you know, and there's many reasons for that. One of which is that technology is their friend. They understand technology. They've grown up with technology. They're not afraid of technology. They see technology as, as something that can provide solutions to problems. And so they get very excited about the, the next generation react to technology that we present in the film. The, the existential threat that they've grown up with that's hung over their heads is climate change. It's not an attack from the, a nuclear uh, the attack from the Soviet Union. That's an ancient history to them. So you have a very different very different mindset. And so what I found, even among uh, pe young people who are would, would identify as anti-nuclear, it's sort of a broadly held sort of view as it goes with the program, it's sort of part of the program of being, you know, a liberal Democrat, for instance. You know, you're anti-nuclear. But it's a very, it's broadly spread, but it's very thin. And once they see the film, they've just come around in droves and get really excited about this. Because it's a, it really is a viable solution. Most of them understand that the, the argument that we're going to power the entire world with wind and solar is not going to work. The idea that we're going to use less energy is not going to happen. And so they find this to be a, a, a hopeful, viable solution, which, which it is. And so there's been a lot of excitement about young people. Yes? Um, it seems to me that there's not, informally there's not a lot of opposition to uh, you know the green movement in this country has got a handful of members of parliament and it's the same across most countries of the world maybe Germany a bit more. So what really stands in the way of, of, of this technology and nuclear expansion? I mean, do we have to wait until the entire sort of city squares are filled with people demanding nuclear energy? I mean, that seems to me a, a strange scenario. What Isn't it really written into your constitution that you can't build a nuclear plant? I believe that's true, yeah, right? Well, I'm, I'm not talking just about Australia now. You've been right. around the world. What, you know, what, what is necessary for this to, to progress? To the well, it gets back to the, the previous money. It all, if you can make money doing this, it's all going to happen. But you also have to, you also have to get the, the, the paranoid, crazy fear thing out of the general sort of consciousness. You have to have public support. But um, cost is the great barrier. Cost is a great barrier, and these are long-term investments that uh, do pay off. And are you know once you've built these plants, they're cash cows because the operating costs are almost nil, fuel costs are almost nil, but they're hugely expensive to build. The Chinese can go ahead and say, "Well, I'm going to build a nuclear plant here, here, here." I think they've got 200 plants they're going to build, but they can just say they're going to do this. Um, thank God they are. Also building you know thousands of coal plants. Um, but uh, uh, the way to make this work in a, a, in a capitalist democracy, I think, the thing that I'm most excited about are small modular reactors, where you can, you, can, you can introduce these things into the marketplace for a reasonable sum of money. You mass produce these things. You make them in a factory using off-the-shelf technology. And I think the, 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 the model for doing this is the commercial jet aircraft industry. You get very high technology, sophisticated, uh, they, I mean, these aluminum tubes that fly hundreds of miles an hour, whizzing millions of people all over the world through storms and lightning bolts and landing and, and crazy, and then we're all alive. We all do it. We all actually get a lot of radiation when we do this. But, um, um, it, but, but it's amazing, and it's through standardization, heavy regulation, competition, all these things, and we can make high technology, complex technology work and be very, very safe and effective. And I think that's a model for uh, the, the future of nuclear power, and that's how you, I think you introduce it in, more widely, is to break through that cost barrier. Yes, sir, right here. It's, it seems that so far, turning around large, rich countries has been very difficult. Might not uh, a possible way to do it be to look at small, poor countries. Uh, admittedly, you know, the, the costs are uh, possibly too large for some places, but but small poor countries, uh, you know, might mm -hmm. be more easily convinced and have the autonomy to go on. There, there's interest in nuclear energy all over the world uh, for a whole host of reasons. You know, national security reasons, in terms of just energy energy security reasons. Um, uh, but one, but right now, the kinds of nuclear plants we are building do require a fairly sophisticated technological 
uh, 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 infrastructure to operate and to run safely and effectively, including a good regulatory environment. Um, so, you know, I think that has to be done carefully. And I, I, I would encourage more international, I, 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 would, I would hope that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, would be more empowered uh, uh, rather than less empowered. And I, I, think, I think the whole thing should be more internationalized. Um, so that developing countries can get the support they need and can be really overseeing you know, control of the international control of the fuel cycle, all these kind of things. The places we really need to focus on are the big CO2 emitting countries, the big developing countries. Now, it's just a fluke of history is that the big, the biggest CO2 emitters in the world also happen to be the countries that have nuclear weapons already. So, and and they they have a sophisticated industrial infrastructure. So, for the next you know, 20, 30 years, where we're gonna really do a big reduction in CO2 emissions. If China goes ahead with nuclear big time, which they are, if India goes ahead with nuclear big time, which they are, Russia, Western Europe's a little dicey, we'll see what happens there. And the United States, we could really do it, we could really cut CO2 emissions and keep us under that, that two degree mark that the climate scientists are telling us. And at that point, hopefully, we will have these small modular, very simple uh, 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 reactors that are basically almost like atomic batteries that you can then introduce into more developing, you know, underdeveloped countries um, that lack that kind of infrastructure. But I wouldn't be in favor of, of, of right now of building massive uh, nuclear plants in, in, in underdeveloped countries that don't have the infrastructure. But, but, surely, but surely the small modular, you know, recent late generation reactors might be just the sort of thing that you can could It'd be perfect. It'd be perfect. I mean, you know, steady supply of electricity so they can lift themselves out of poverty and keep the factories going and stuff like that. And desalination, which is a huge issue. Another reason we're going to be using more and more energy around the world is we're running out of fresh water supplies. We're depleting our aquifers and we're going to need massive amount of, amounts of energy to desalinate water, which is why there's so much interest in the Middle East right now nuclear power, and I know you get a lot of smirks with that one, but that, that is actually one of the reasons. They're just running out of water. Yes, sir. Because, because it's difficult because of what's happening in Germany. Well, let's, okay, well, let's look at what Germany is doing. I mean, Germany, Germany is doing an amazing thing, and I think uh, I'm interested in seeing how it plays out. Um, but here's what they've done. They, they have, the entire political class is behind renewables. That's an amazing thing. That, I mean, that's your biggest first hurdle if you want to do this. You've got to get political support across the board, and they've got that. They control of the government, they've done it. They've, got a, they've committed $130 billion already to doing solar. They now, and they, half of the world's supply of solar PV is, is in Germany right now, and they have now get 5% of their electricity from solar. It's amazing, but it still leaves 95% coming from someplace else. They got, still got a long way to go. Now, 7% of their energy comes from wind. Um, that's great, too. But what they have, the big mistake they've done is they've decided to use their massive investment in renewable energy to displace their nuclear plants, which are all in Bavaria, because they're worried that a tsunami is going to knock them out like Fukushima. Seriously, the, the Fukushima caused them to shut down German nuclear plants, probably the best operated nuclear plants in the world, that are in Bavaria. And they're shutting them down, and the, the result of that, so Germany, you know, the, uh, before Fukushima, it was 18% Nuclear, so now you combine five, seven, that's 12. 12% 12 renewables, 80% nuclear, they're running a deficit. What are they doing? Building coal plants as fast as they can. The single biggest source of CO2 emissions in all of Europe is in Germany right now, with a new state-of-the-art coal plant that they just opened up. Not a single protester, not a single green protested the opening of that plant. Germany is the only country in Western Europe that is still building coal plants, and it's, they're burning the dirtiest coal on the planet, lignite coal and their CO2 emissions are going up. Now, they say, okay, 
At a certain point, we're going to shut down all of our nuclear plants. We're going to keep building renewable. At a certain point, somewhere out in the 2020s, our CO2 emissions may start coming down, and we may start uh, uh, reducing um, CO2 emissions. Maybe. Um, they also their electric their electric uh, rates are going through the roof. The only way that they are keeping companies like BMW and Siemens and stuff like that in the country is they're subsidizing. They're, they've got a, the 100 top country companies, energy producing companies in Germany are subsidized by the German government. So all the German taxpayers are paying to keep industry from fleeing the country. And they're importing nuclear power. And they're importing nuclear power from France. So far, it's not working out as much as people like. And I hear constantly, I've heard on the radio, in the newspapers, um, environmental activists in the United States claiming that Germany is now 50% uh, solar power. You know, because because on one afternoon, actually two afternoons, on a Saturday where there was no cloud cover, um, the sun shone on Germany, and they got 50% of their electricity from from solar for about an hour. But annual on an annual basis, it's 5%, and not too many people know that for some reason. Okay, pointing Thank up you. here. Okay. Um, there are a couple of references in the film to fourth gen plants and also thorium um, fed reactors. Moving forward, um, I remember as a kid, I was told you know, nuclear uh, energy had about a 90 to 100 year lifespan. That's back you know, 30 years ago. I was also told back then that coal in Queensland could power the world for 450 years. Um, how long, with all the recycling and sort of re energization of your old fuel rods, can we rely on this source for? And how's it going to um, stack up to you know, black energy in the, um, in the next 20 to, 20 to 50 years? Black, cost, en cost black yeah. energy, do you uh, say? Yeah, coal. I'm, I'm ex oh, ex black energy. Okay. Ex coal fired. Oh, the dark fired. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know the you know the the the, the football field yep. thing in the film. The football the the football field of, of spent fuel. Okay. If you put that through an IFR, for instance, or in a new fast reactor, and you recycled it again and again, that stockpile of nuclear waste the United States has produced over the last 50 years. Um, would power everything in the United States at today's level, including the transportation sector, absolutely everything. For how many years? 1,000 years. 1,000 years without ever mining a gram of uranium again, okay? The United Kingdom has enough nuclear waste to power all the United Kingdom for 500 years without, again, you know, um, this, and the reason for that is this once through fuel cycle, which we briefly explained in the beginning of the film, that this stuff, we only use about 3% of the energy in the uranium, the rest is as parts, so this is fuel. We will never, ever, ever bury this stuff for 100,000 years. It's an incredibly precious resource. So we will store it for maybe 100 years, 200 years, but it's going to be used for future generations in nuclear power plants. So how does thorium look as an alternative if that ever runs out? Thorium is abundant all over the place. Thorium is amazing. I, I'm, I'm really excited about thorium. Um, um, most particularly because of it, it's it's uh, it, it's not impossible to make a bomb out of it, but it's really difficult. So, um, but there's all kinds. You know, this is the other thing. You know, uh, the reason I profiled the IFR in the film is because it was a story. We actually built this thing. They tried to melt it down. There's a good, you know, and there was a big fight in Congress. It says stories. As a filmmaker, I could tell the story, but it's emblematic of the excitement that there is around new generation, next generation, different types of nuclear power that I knew nothing about before I started research, researching this. We will never build a plant like Fukushima, Chernobyl. Forget it. That was insane. Well, that was, that was gone. Ancient history. But you know the, the 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 plants that we're going to build from here on out are just orders of magnitude safer. There's a huge excitement around thorium. There's a huge excitement about what Bill Gates is doing, the small modular reactors. The Chinese are moving ahead with all this. There's all kinds of exciting things that are going on. And I think another thing that I find often happens is people are comparing the kind of solar power that we might have in 2025 with the kind of nuclear power we had in 1975. You know. And that's not a fair comparison. There's been huge technological advances in everything, including nuclear. Mm -hmm. Yes. You brought up the fourth generation plants in the ice. Is there an issue with the decommissioning of those plants? 
Is there an issue with the decommissioning of, of uh, nuclear plants, which were not not as good at the technology? I mean, it's an expensive thing to do. It takes a long time. It has been done. We've been doing it. Um, uh, the the thing about it, all of that is all of that is paid for up front, and that's all. And, and I don't know what happened. Well, Australia's not building nuclear plants. So I don't know. Uh, it's moved here, but the United States. That's all part. That's all paid in as you as these plants are built, and including the, res the, the disposal of the waste and all of that stuff. Um, but um, the plants that they're building now, the new, the French plants, are, are the, ini the initial license, uh, uh, the, the initial license period is 80 years. These, we actually don't know, we actually don't know how long you can keep a nuclear reactor going. Um, I mean, you need to upgrade the computers, you need to upgrade uh, 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 safety systems around them to keep them modern and fresh, but the actual core elements, we don't know how long these things can last. Um, they can go for maybe a hundred years, maybe more. But certainly, you always want to go with, you know, you want to go with the best, safest technology. And and it, it's actually, I think, seeing what happened at Fukushima, I think there's a, 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 a certainly a good reason to responsibly and gradually phase out those 1970s reactors. And in fact, the Fukushima reactor was ready to be de decommissioned, I think, a month. You know, it was in like, the accident happened on March 11th, I think in April or something, it was supposed to be shut down and mothballed anyway. And interesting, crazily enough, the reason they didn't flood that thing with seawater to begin with is because they wanted to save the plant. No, well, you know, they should have just flooded it with seawater and be done with it. Does, it, does the infrastructure become waste? Um, there are certainly elements that would need to be, I'm sure there are elements that are, that are radioactive that need to be buried, but you're still talking about a very minor amount of stuff that's containable. The thing, the thing that impresses me about nuclear with regards to the waste thing is that the waste is kept here. It's contained, it's manageable, and it's not a big volume of stuff. You compare that to the waste of fossil fuels, which is just unmanaged, going into the atmosphere, acidifying the oceans, killing the Great Barrier Reef, which should be of concern to you guys, uh, certainly a concern to me, I don't even live here, but that's happening. And, and uh, let alone climate change, it's killing, according to the World Health Organization, three million people every year, um, and, and, and could simply destroy our lives. So that's an unmanageable waste. Um, you can't look at you can't look at an energy technology. I will only accept it if it's absolutely perfect and has no uh, no waste, no problem whatsoever. Uh, it's all about weighing cost and benefits. The, the nuclear power has some waste, but also produces incredible amounts of energy. As a graphic, you remember the graphic in the film about um, safety? You know, the, the 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 coal is the worst, like gas, like oil, gas. And that the nuclear per unit of energy produced is actually safer than solar power. It's remarkable, but the reason is that solar produces very little energy, but it, it's it's the rare earth metals that are mined, the mining of it, the toxic process going to making solar panels, and the fact that people actually fall off roofs installing them and, and working with electronics. Actually, people do die. It's enough to statistically make it more dangerous per unit of energy produced than nuclear. Wind apparently is a little safer. What Although, are your stats like on those? Um, just uh, what? Carry on. You want to say something about decommissioning? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just a couple of useful um, points about de decommissioning. The cost of it built in up front is about one to two dollars per megawatt hour. When the cost of the electricity overall out of a nuclear plant is maybe a hundred or one hundred and ten. So as a proportion of the overall cost of the electricity built in up front over the whole life of the plant. It sounds like a lot of money when you get to the end of the year to spend it, but that's been built up over about 60 years and selling an enormous amount of electricity. So that's been driven very much. You also have to decommission solar panels after 20 years. Wind turbines, 20 years, they're done. You gotta take them down. You gotta grind them up, melt them down. Solar panels, as I said, are incredibly toxic and they are toxic waste. They need to be carefully managed and recycled. Um, so all of the, and that's every 20 years, you know, that the, you could build out that enormous inf energy infrastructure over, you know, hundreds of square miles and it, you gotta redo it again. So all of these things, that's, that's, that's a problem with, with all energy infrastructure. 
Yeah, um, you already asked a question. Somebody who has not answered a question. Uh, a woman, a woman, let's get a woman who has a question. Yes, right here, there we go, yes. You, right here, the black hair, yeah. Um, shown this to crowds that are almost 90% implacably anti-nuclear. Okay? And I have turned them around with this movie. Drastically. Um, environmental activists, climate activists, people who have invested their, their uh, time and energy into promoting renewables only, who see this as a has been very, very supportive of this film, and this has opened their eyes. I did not make this film to preach the choir at all. I made this film, this is a kind of a unique documentary, and that most documentaries are, are really take uh, an audience who's already uh, emotive and exercised about a problem, the um, climate change, and just gets them more cranked up. It doesn't really, like Inconvenient Truth, for instance, did that, I don't think there are too many people who didn't believe in climate change and went to see Inconvenient Truth and, and, and changed their mind. It was mostly people who already believed in climate change, went to see the film, got all fired up and told their friends you gotta go see this movie. And in fact, the pol it actually polarized the situation to the degree that after Inconvenient Truth came out, um, a belief in climate change actually declined. It's an amazing story. Um, so um, I feel the film is, is balanced in that uh, I'm rectifying a balance. All I've ever seen is, for the last 40 years, are you know countless documentaries, for instance, that only tell the horrors of nuclear power um, and only tell the negative side and, and have never told any other thing. And I would say that about you know any film about climate change. I don't know any film about climate change has ever talked to climate deniers. You know, I mean, suddenly with this film. People say, oh, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you tell the other side? The other side, the other side is integral to the movie. The whole first third of the movie is the case against nuclear power. Everything that's, every, the, everything that's addressed in the film starts from the point of view is like, oh, waste is a huge gargantuan problem. Well, is it really? Or safety is a huge gargantuan problem. A million people died at Chernobyl. Well, is it really? It's all coming from that point of view. So, and these are just simply, this is simply based on hard scientific fact. These aren't opinions. Unless you want to say, well, okay, Helen Caldicott has an opinion that uh, a million people died at Chernobyl and the World Health Organization has an opinion that 60 people died at Chernobyl. If I, I'm not saying 60 people died at Chernobyl. I'm just presenting you with the information that she says this and the World Health Organization says that. I believe the World Health Organization. I believe the IPCC about climate change rather than a professor at the University of Kansas who come up with a study who says that climate change is a hoax. You know, I can go on the internet and produce God reams of things that say climate change is a hoax. But the best science we have, the consensus science, the best, the best science, climate scientists in the world, one of whom is, is, is here, Tom Wigley, where are you? Um, uh, there he is, um, tells us that climate change is real. Um, so that's how I approach this. And sometimes the chips didn't fall my way. For instance, uh, uh, the World Health Organization study projects 4,000 additional cases of cancer from uh, Chernobyl, which we included in the film, even though it's never been measured and will probably never be seen. We included it in the film because that's what the consensus science tells us, and we went with that. You know, uh, Robert, we've got uh, six minutes. I, w I just want to leave you with one final thought, and then we'll close this up. Um, what we do, what our generation, everybody in this room decides to do, and so the kind of energy that we support, the politicians that we vote for, the things that we tell our friends, um, it is incumbent upon us uh, 
because we've got about 20 years to decarbonize the world's electric grid. It is an awesome responsibility. And it's an awesome task. And it's a gargantuan problem. We need to throw absolutely everything at it. So whether you disagree with the premise of this movie or you agree with it, I hope that you'll come away uh, uh, with a sense that this is a conversation that we need to have and that we can't close our minds to this. We need to talk about it. If countries want to reject nuclear power for whatever reason, that's okay, but at least that decision has been made with open eyes and not dogma and not believing the very worst that professional anti-nuclear activists have to say about it, that, with, that this, is, this is a decision that's made with open eyes and, and, and op an open discussion, which is what I'm, what I'm trying to have. Because if we screw this up, if we get this wrong, if we reject nuclear power because we don't like it, because we're afraid of it, and 20 years we, from now we got to look in our grandchildren's eyes and say, you know what? Uh, we weren't able to do it with renewables. Whoops. That doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. It's, we are, we have an awesome responsibility upon us. That's why I made this film. That's why I'm traveling around the world with us. That's why I'm dedicating my life right now to speaking to groups like you, because we've really got to get a handle on this, and we cannot, cannot, cannot close our eyes to this incredible technology that shows so much promise. So, um, thank you. I hope you'll tweet like a mofo and uh, tell your friends about this. And it's been a great honor and a pleasure to be here with you. So, thank you.